thank you very much for uh, asking me to share my views and uh, on this uh, complex complex subject um, now uh, i will start with some case presentations and um, we will take it from there uh, i i'll just illustrate the, how difficult the problem is um, with the posterior valve now this is a case of a, a term baby a newborn three and a half uh, kilos normal creatinine um, it was a stable baby so a primary valve fulguration was performed and as you can see here you can see the the dilatation in the posterior urethra and that is a hypertrophic bladder neck now this is the repeat vcug after four months um, there is some dilatation still there in the posterior urethra but the anterior urethral stream has become better now you see a lot of bladder neck hypertrophy is persisting but the bladder shape itself looks okay now the reason i'm stressing all these things is when you assess these patients after uh, treatment um, you need to know how the bladder is behaving how whether the valve is gone and how the upper tract is behaving so this is the same patient after two year follow up and um, we have done a checkscopy there is no residual valve but there is bilateral mild hydroeurotrinophrosis in this patient the creatinine is still normal there is no urinary tract infection and there is no wetting so the child is uh, having normal voiding cycles but if you can see here uh, in behind the bladder so you can see that the dilated ureter is there um, and uh, there is a upper tract dilatation so this is a patient where there is an early evidence of persistent hydroeurotrinophrosis after we have cleared the posterior urethral valve um now that 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 could turn into um, a late presentation later on um, this is a 10 year old boy who was seen in the patients with the dribbling of urine and urinary tract infection history of urgency and frequency in the past he had a posterior urethral valve for which a bilateral urethrostomy was performed in the newborn period they underwent a posterior urethral valve fulguration at 6 months of age and the closure of urethrostomies were performed at 18 months of age elsewhere now um, this is the patient i'm seeing for the first time is a 10 year old already is dribbling of urine and there is urgency frequency um so thus bilateral urethrostomy um increase the risk of uh, the bad bladder that that is a question where, which we have to think about now when he when we evaluated him he had a persistent hydroeurotrinophrosis and the first thing i need to do is to make sure that his urethra is okay so we we need to get a uroflow and we see you see we being an older boy we got a uroflow and the uroflow showed a flat brace and um, the pcu just showed evidence of narrowing at the posterior urethra so we did a cystoscopy and did a oiu and uh, after that he became all right uh, he had a good stream his dribbling got better but everything was for a short period and then he presented again uh, in another two years time with the urgency and dribbling and this time the creatinine has started going up so we have to reevaluate him at this stage and and uh, as um, we keep on um, stressing on this uh, posterior urethral valve it is not one problem where um, the the treatment ends uh, with valve fulguration it actually starts there so they can um, present in multiple ways so this fellow had a urodynamics and his pressures was uh, going up uh, to 35 to 40 degrees cent uh, 40 cc and he started leaking at half the capacity or less than half the capacity um now his ultrasound shows bilateral hydroeurotrinophrosis uh, and the right kidney has got literally no cortex with the 10% function and the poor drainage now this is the background we have um now will you start him on oxybutynin at this stage will you start this patient on clean intermittent catheterization whether you administer him on night time drainage so these are some other questions and thought process which we need to go through um so as the um, uh, as there is an urgency and dribbling if the pressures are high um whether it is enough or whether we have already tried oxybutynin so these are the things we need to really look at it um the the uh, anticholinergic medication are used as the main thing to relax the bladder by most of them some people use alpha blockers 
to relax the, the hypertrophied sphincter, which is particularly useful when there is a large post-void residual volume. Um, clean intermittent catheterization and nighttime drainage have also been uh, found to be a very useful settings in this uh, situation. So that was is a urodynamics, which showed uh, kept on increasing the pressure with the unstable contractions as well as uh, poor compliance. Uh, so he has been on anticholinergics and nighttime catheter drainage, and despite of that, he has been deteriorating renal function. Uh, now that that means two things: either the anticholinergic medication is not enough, um, we have dropped the dose, or it's not working. And the bladder is really bad, and then we need to go for an alternative method of management. Uh, so th these are the patients where we sit on the edge, where we really have to make a decision. And as I told you earlier, this patient had a right kidney, which was refluxing uh, with a poor drainage and hydroeuropronephrosis. Um, so we thought, why don't we offer a um, lap nephrectomy and urethrosystoplasty? So this is what we have done. So we, have, uh, we did a lap nephrectomy and um, through the, um, the spinal steel incision, that was the original urethrostomy scar. So we just extended the scar and then delivered the kidney through that, opened up the dilated system, and then did a um, bladder augmentation, a urethrocystoplasty. As you all know, urethrocystoplasty is probably the best uh, option available in these patients who may be a potential candidate for transplant. Uh, and an ileocystoplasty has got its own disadvantages uh, with the bacterial colonization, which may uh, put the previous future transplant at risk. But at the same time, this is not always available. So whenever there is a patient with a VURD, so valve unilateral reflux and dysplasia, um, there is a dilated system. I do not go for upfront nephrectomy in these patients because I know at some point in the, the bladder starts behaving bad. At that time, I can do the nephrectomy and use the uh, the, the, the dilated upper tract as well as uh, the ureters for urethrocystoplasty. Uh, obviously, urethrocystoplasty doesn't provide a, a huge increase in capacity, but these patients are not a neurogenic kind of bladders, so uh, um, a modest increase in capacity is probably enough because the capacity is not always too bad. Now, this is a, a, a slightly different spectrum. So we are having a 16-year-old boy who presented for the first time with acute retention of urine. Although it should be happening at this age of you know, development, it still happens. Uh, so this is a, he's been dribbling from childhood and uh, for some reason he has been missed and the cystoscopy uh, revealed the post valve. So he underwent a valve vibration for the first time uh, at the age of 16 and uh, his uh, damage has already happened. Hemoglobin is 6.5, um, creatinine is 9.8, his potassium is pretty high, and all the parameters show that he is, uh, he is already in end stage. So that is the huge capacity bladder, which is like a pregnant uterus. Um, so that kind of decompensated bladder, even after a valve filtration, now he is not able to um, produce a proper flow. So that is a typically interrupted flow where he has to uh, avoid with abdominal straining. So that is a valsalva. So large capacity bladder typically avoids with abdominal straining with a poor period during the voiding. So these are the late uh, presentations um, where uh, we have to make some mechanism to make sure that these fellows are able to empty the bladder. Although the obstruction is relieved, uh, you have left it too late. Um, so what are the options prior to transplant? Does it go on a urethral CAC? Some of them may have a sensate urethra, and um, we may have to do a microphonal procedure for them. Now, coming to the actual uh, valve bladder, uh, the, the term valve bladder covers all the dysfunctional bladders in patients with the posterior urethral valve. The term valve bladder syndrome was first used by Mitchell. It uh, describes the pathophysiology where the underlying obstruction initiates cyclical events leading eventually to bladder decompensation. So if you go through this um, particular flow chart, um, the posterior urethral valve um, leads to literal hypertrophy, and then there's an increase in intravesical pressures. The pressures getting transmitted to the upper tract 
causes impaired renal function, impaired concentrating ability. So you have an increased urine output. So already the blood has a small and there's an increased output. So what happens is uh, it, it causes an impairment in the bladder in T. So as the, the, bladder, the, the bladder is not able to store, the bladder is not able to empty properly, it keeps on filling. And then that becomes a vicious cycle, uh, causing more and more problem. So they go through these phases, initial period of bladder instability is there, followed by impaired compliance. And then uh, they have poor bladder <coughs> emptying, and then they end up in the myogenic failure. So the myogenic failure is the last stage where um, the bladder decompensates, it doesn't contract, and one is dependent on um, SCAC. So how do these patients present? Um, in, a, in a young young child, like three or four year old, the first time you have to suspect this is like when the child starts developing a daytime wetting. So a child who has been very well after valve filtration has been stable and suddenly start having wet pants during the day. So that is one of the important way they present. Then raising creatinine or uh, raising hydrouretronophosis during the follow, um, that is another way they can be picked up. Despite the valve is gone, they start having uh, misbehaving, the upper tract start behaving. The ultrasound is uh, an important investigation to look for post void residual uh, volume. Uh, and often they have a large post void residual volume, which may be because of a bladder neck component. Uh, then uh, Euroflow is a useful investigation, particularly if the child is older than five years. Um, then Wadding Sister Urethrogram uh, can really help to eliminate the residual valves or structures, uh, and uh, that, that should be ruled out before you even start any bladder medications. A neurodynamic study is, is a crucial step in deciding where exactly we stand, what stage of valve bladder this patient is in, and how to treat further. So that, that is the way to evaluate these patients. Um, so if somebody is having a poor flow, that can be because of a structure uh, where uh, the, um, the, the flow is very flat, or it can be because of a poor bladder contractility. So that can be a typical interrupted voiding with the valsalva voiding where abdominal straining is causing uh, the, the, the empty. Now here in urodynamics, you can either have a, a poorly compliant with the high pressures, or you can have an atonic bladder where the, the, the voiding phase is having very poor bladder contractions. Uh, so both are um, both are important. You can see in this patient, uh, the, in this in this urodynamics on the left, the the flow actually is good. So there is no obstruction, but it is the bladder component which is causing a problem. And in this, uh, the second urodynamics, it's actually the, um, the the bladder emptying is the problem. If there is no problem during the filling. So we need to know exactly where we stand. So if there is an early stage of valve bladder. So we can put them on anticholinergic medications. Um, some people put them on empirical anticholinergic medications straight away after valve filtration. Um, so they put them on oxybutin at a different doses. Um, I don't, um, I generally wait uh, to see how they are doing. Some of them do well. In that case, I don't have to give them anticholinergics. Um, the problem with anticholinergics is how long you keep them when to stop them. If you keep on keeping them on anticholinergics for too long, that itself may lead to an amount of, um, um, you're, you're precipitating an amount of atonic bladder. Uh, then alpha blockers, some people put these children regularly on alpha blockers. I don't. I prefer to use alpha blockers when there is a, a bladder neck hypertrophy and there is a large post word residual volume. So those are the typical indications for alpha blockers. Um, Mirror backgrounds, um, these have been used, um, very little experience with that. We are actually doing a study at the moment to look at the role of mirror background. We probably will be presenting our um, results in the UCCon. Um, so again, all these medicines, how long to keep them, when to stop them, what is the maximum dose? So these are all done based on a trial and error method only. Um, there is no right and wrong here, when to start, whether you start empirically before the event actually happens. Uh, but basic things are important, timed voiding, double voiding. I mean, these are components of the urotherapy where they actually sit with the patient and the parent and tell that um, it is important not to uh, keep a lot of uh, residual volume. So 
because of the bladder neck component, uh, they may not empty it completely. So a double void or triple void is sometimes essential to start fresh filling cycle there. Uh, also timed voiding, some of them do delay the voiding, leading to um, too large bladder fillings. Uh, so that also should be avoided. Uh, so these are all simple methods. Um, the role of interventions, bladder neck incisions, some people do fancy bladder neck incisions. Uh, I don't fancy bladder neck incisions uh, regularly. Uh, the role of Botox is unclear in valve bladders. Uh, there are studies where they have tried it. Um, Mitrofenov. Mitrofenov um, can be useful, particularly if you want somebody to start the CAC program. Uh, unlike the patients who are having a neurogenic bladder with a um, urethra which is not sensate, these uh, valve bladders have a typically sensate urethra and the hypertrophied bladder neck makes the catheterization uh, sometimes difficult. It can bounce back and then cause uh, severe pain, spasm, uh, especially if it coils with the posterior urethra. So uh, a mitrofenov alone without an augment can be a useful option to enable um, uh, urethral CAC uh, in these patients. Um, now, bladder augmentation, as I said, uh, if at all possible, I will try to get the um, get the augmentation done with the urethral cystoplasty. Um, but uh, sometimes we may have to do a bowel augment as well in these patients. Uh, and a timely augment can actually delay or postpone the transplantation. Now, whether the aug uh, the, whether the augmentation uh, should be done before or after the transplant. Uh, these are all difficult questions. Um, the transplant surgeons sometimes do not want the augmentation to be done before. And there are a few reports where the transplant has actually reversed the bal bal bladder. So this um, catch-22 situation continues uh, throughout. Uh, now the syndrome of nocturnal over distension of the bladder is real. In, 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 uh, in the valve bladder, uh, nighttime drainage is really helpful to empty the bladder. Uh, and, uh, and as urethral CAC, if it is difficult, uh, for a metrophenol, we can also use the uric cap. So that is a urotrach metrophenol where um, a trans ureterostomy has been done and the distal end of the ureter has been used as metrophenol. Uh, you can also remove a non-functioning dysplastic kidney on one side and then keep the ureter as the urotrach metrophenol. Uh, so that is also possible. That's particularly if the ureter is not dilated, the upper tract is not dilated, then you're not going to use it for a uh, ureter cystoplasty. You might as well use it as a ureteric metrophenol. Uh, so I'll summarize here uh, whatever we have discussed. Um, so the important thing in the evaluation of a valve bladder is to exclude a structure or a residual valve before you even start any treatment. Anticholinergics, alpha blockers. These are all um, key uh, interventions uh, to be done at the right time. Um, timed voiding, double voiding. So these are all important uh, part of urotherapy. Then um, CAC and nighttime drainage, uh, it can be urethral CAC or via metrophenol. Um, both are useful. And a timely urodynamics, uh, metrophenol and or an augment um, can be uh, useful to delay uh, the end stage renal failure and a transplant in these patients with the valve bladder. Obviously, a nephrologist input is essential throughout. Uh, so we need to really assess where, which stage of the valve bladder we are in, and then uh, titrate the treatment accordingly. So that's about it. Thank you very much.